Okay. Good morning. This is the Finance Committee meeting of the Mackinac Bridge Authority being held virtually this Friday, March 12, 2021. Uh, Kim Nowak as the Executive Secretary slash CEO, could you please take roll call of the committee members? Um, and just a note, committee members, please state your, your physical location where you're sitting at, um, at, at your computer. That's right. If you just give us the city um, you're calling in from. So, uh, Chairwoman Trahey. Present. Lansing. Member Steidel. Uh, here from Cocoa Beach, Florida. Member Milliken. Present. Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you. Great. We also have other members of the uh, Mackinac Bridge Authority uh, here viewing, so thank you for your uh, presence here. Uh, first item is the approval of the agenda, and we do have an amendment to an agenda item. That is agenda item number four regarding the audit report. Um, instead of being an action item, we would like to amend this to be an informational item. Do I have approval of the amended agenda? Are there any discussion about that? I'll make a motion to accept the amended agenda. I provide support. Great, thank you, Member Steidel and uh, Milliken for your support. Uh, first item up on deck is the, uh, is there any public comment, I guess, out there uh, for anybody who's participating from the public on any of the agenda items? And I believe, James, you're looking through to see if there's any public comment. Yes, at this time, I do not see any public comment through our online comment form. Okay, great. Thank you, James. The next item on the agenda is the Treasury update. This is an informational update that's being presented by Woody Tyler. Um, I'm not sure if I saw Lon jumping on, but if she does, that's great. Both of you are from the Bureau of Investments of the Michigan Department of Treasury and you're gonna present uh, the investment update as well as an economic report. So your slides are up and live, uh, Woody, if you'd like to get started. Terrific, thank you, and I apologize. For some reason, I still have not been able to get on to uh, Teams, but we'll just kind of roll ahead, and, and I'm glad I, I can't see if Lon is on. Hopefully, um, uh, Lon was out for most of the week, so, uh, um, Hello, Lon. We'll talk a little later. Uh, I know she had surgery, so um, I, I know she's on the mend, so that's good. Um, if you have the slides up, um, we'll just be covering an investment update, and then we'll be talking about the, the economic update, and that's primarily what I'd like to focus on. It's, it's a kind of a condensed version, because I know you have a lot of information uh, you guys are going to be going through today. Um, but uh, the economic update will really kind of focus on interest rates, and that's very obviously important to this portfolio because it's all fixed income. If you go to the outline for slide one, we on uh, this, this piece in talking about the investment update, we'll go through the current allocation, the estimated income, the performance of the portfolio, and then the market value since 2010. And then again, when we talk about the economic update, We'll be focusing on interest rates because we are facing a very different economy than we were in 2020. So we began 2020 with a pretty good economy and it just got worse throughout the year. This year looks to be just the mirror image of that. And interest rates are so important. Um, it, it really does. Uh, what they did certainly in 2020 was primarily drop down, which is good for a portfolio of fixed income they appreciate. Um, but that plays in reverse uh, as interest rates move up. Um, if we go to page two, I'm sorry, let's go to three, the asset allocation. Um, as of the end of December 2020, the portfolio was up roughly 7%, so it finished at $128 million. And if you look at what those investments primarily were made of, you kind of working from left to right, we had government credit bonds at 11%, Treasury bonds at roughly 25%, and then government-backed mortgages at just under 33%. These are primarily Ginnie Mae securities where we pick up a higher yield. And then we have cash at 31.5%. This is higher than what we typically run at. We usually will have this portfolio 
somewhere between five to 10% in cash, primarily because cash is, an, is a low return asset. Um, we were at the high end of that range. We were at 10% back in July, but we allowed that to move up primarily because the interest rate environment Interest rates have picked up, but they moved down in 2020 because we have really a, what we'd call a, a, an investment party in there who's not really interested in getting their return so much as stimulating the economy. And that player, and they happen to be a big player, is the Federal Reserve Bank. And this is happening throughout the world with all central banks stepping in to lower interest rates to stimulate the economy. That's good for the economy. Um, it's not so good if you're an investor. So we allowed cash to build up in the second half of the year. Um, and we just this week started deploying some of that cash back into the market. Any, any questions at this time? And again, I apologize if I couldn't get on to uh, Teams this morning. Okay. Turning to page four, the estimated income of the portfolio is 2.1 million for the next 12 months. And you can see that is primarily made up of the bond portfolio, the return is estimated at 2.4%, but rates again drop significantly below this. And so we have roughly, you know, 20% or one fifth of this portfolio sort of turning over every year. It will be turning over into those lower rates. So the contribution from interest income will drop off a little bit. Um, but our expectations are in the long run that rates will normalize back up to those levels that we're currently invested at, that 2.4, 2.5% in the long run. Um, page five, recent market performance as of December 31st of 2020. You'll see as you look down that one year column on the left, if you look at the Bloomberg government long bond index, that is a 20 year government bond. We don't, we don't invest in that extended duration. We're typically in the five to six um, year duration period, but you can see in the, the one year period ending December of 2020, that long year, that 20 year government bond was up almost 18% beating um, other risky assets in the bond land, uh, the, the Bloomberg Egg Bond Index, the High Yield Index, which were only up 5.3%, I'm sorry, 7.5% and 7.1%. It came close to even beating the S&P 500, which is a tough benchmark or has been a tough benchmark to beat. That was up 18.4%. And apologies um, to the left of that, uh, that 18.4% in the fourth quarter for the S&P should actually be 12.2%. Uh, that was an error on my part. Um, now, if we roll the clock forward, if you look in the fourth quarter column, uh, the interest rates primarily in 2020 fell in the first half of the year, and then they slowly began to move up in the second half of the year in anticipation of the economic recovery will likely be seen in 2021. So you get that Bloomberg government bond index, that 20 year 3% in the fourth quarter. And if you look year to date, it's off just over 10%. So in the past two and a half months, interest rates have really lifted on the prospects of economic recovery and potentially higher inflation that may come along with it. So we are seeing rates back up move back up. That is good for reinvesting. And again, we've taken that cash and started to redeploy that back into the market. The next page is the um, portfolio performance. And if you look to the far right, um, and again, we've, we've been investing primarily over this entire period, somewhere between, you know, roughly two and a half percent plus or minus. Um, that's typically where um, government bonds have sort of been bouncing around for that period. But you, if you look on the far right, uh, the portfolio was up 6.6%. Um, that came from appreciation. So we had 
a return of roughly two and a half percent, and then the remaining portion was appreciation. Um, but we allowed cash again to build up in this portfolio. If you look down below that column for the one year, our benchmarks or that U.S. government bond portfolio was up seven percent. So we were shy of that last year, but that came primarily because again we allowed cash to build up in the portfolio. That portfolio, that U.S. government bond index will be dropping more than what we expect this portfolio to drop, um, primarily because uh, they're longer duration than what, what we've taken on. Uh, to the next page, um, slide seven, the market value, you can see, say, going back to 2010, this has increased nicely over this extended period, both from contributions that have been made from the Mackinac Bridge Authority um, interest income and depreciation in the bond portfolio. Uh, we break that out on the next page, um, but we break it out uh, basically for the fiscal year. So it, it doesn't match. You'll see, um, it, you know, in September of 2020, the portfolio was roughly $124 million. So we didn't have the year end number. But if you look at um, you know, both the contributions along this chart, you can see, you know, again, we have investment income, we have appreciation or depre depreciation, which will come when interest rates go up. And then we have contributions, which is that purple line has been um, a steady contribution. And probably the best way of looking at this, or of seeing this visually, I think, is if you look down below to the left in 2014, the appreciation, depreciation. In 2014 and 2015, we went through a period of what they call the taper tantrum. Ben Bernanke um, talked about tapering purchases of bonds and bond interest rates shot up. And consequently, again, think of, think of the bond portfolios being a teeter-totter as interest rates go down, the value of the portfolio goes up. Conversely, if interest rates go up, the value of the portfolio drops. And so in that period, 2014 and 2015, we actually saw, um, you know, depreciation in the value of the portfolio. And then the next time we saw it was in 2018, um, Fed Chairman Powell began to increase rates. The economy was doing well. Um, the long bond actually broke above three, almost three and a half percent shortly, unfortunately, for a brief period uh, in late 2018. And you can see the we again had some depreciation in the value of the portfolio of roughly 2.8 million in that time. And then 2019, 2020, um, roughly 10 million, 10 and a half million dollars of depreciation because interest rates are falling. We expect this year that um, we'll see some um, depreciation in the value of the portfolio of roughly one to $2 million potentially um, because interest rates are expected to rise. And again, we raised cash in expectation of that and are now deploying it back in at those higher rates. Any any questions? I know I went through that fairly quickly. Happy to answer any if you have some before we go on to the economic piece. Okay. Well, it's been a while since we've had really good economic news. So if we roll into the economic outlook um, and then jump to the agenda, we have economic outlook, no surprise here, is still dependent on the virus. But that outlook is very, very good. We have three very, um, very good vaccinations out there that, that are being deployed. Uh, combined with this, we have a massive stimulus um, that will work in line with those vaccinations and will lead, you know, our expectation, but most economists out there are expecting a very rapid economic recovery. And then what does that mean for interest rates? And so we'll, we'll talk about that in the next couple pages. Um, many of you probably have seen a chart like this before on page one, the economic recovery will follow the virus. And the estimates out there have been that if once we reach what they call herd immunity of 70 or 75%, um, really we should kind of get back to normal, uh, knock on wood. Um, the expectation in this chart, if you look down below, we have this purple line of people who have been infected, and that's estimated to be somewhere between 25 and 30 percent of the population, even though the reported amount is below that. More people have been infected by, by the virus than have been reported. 
And, uh, and so with a combination of those already infected with vaccinations, this chart was assuming that by July of 2021, we would reach that sort of 70% mark. That actually seems to have been pulled forward now with a ramp up uh, in, in vaccinations to maybe 3 million a day. We could hit that mark actually in May of 2021. So then I know some people are out there talking, maybe this was um, launched sort of yesterday, that by July 4th, we'll have two independents Independence Day that we normally celebrate, and then the independence from this uh, this virus. And knock on wood that that is true, but that's very good news. So what does that mean if we turn to page two, assisted by the massive stimulus that we're seeing out there, which is almost 50% of U.S. GDP? And we get to that number if you look at the United States in that left-hand column, and then move to the left potential central bank liquidity of $6.2 trillion. This isn't you know, a direct infusion into the market. It helps stimulate the economy by keeping interest rates low, but that's, that's almost 30% of GDP. To the right of that, um, this was in combination with a $1.9 trillion stimulus signed into legislation yesterday. That's almost 20% of GDP. Summing those two up, um, we're looking at roughly 48.5% of GDP uh, coming out there and, and stimulating the economy. The important thing is looking at the um, fiscal stimulus. Uh, the estimate is that we have, by many economists, the U.S. consumer has somewhere between one and a half to two trillion dollars in excess savings. That is nearly 10% of GDP. Much of the, a portion of that is estimated to come out in the second half of this year. How much of that comes out will really determine how big and how quickly GDP snaps back. Um, but you can imagine, again, it's roughly 10% of GDP. Um, if a half of that comes out, we will be looking at very, very strong economic numbers. So if we turn to page three, what does that mean? If you look at that chart on the right-hand side, this is a global economy, but the U.S. economy is trading almost in line with this. You see that gray line that looks like that V-shaped recovery in 2021 up to 8%. That's a number we haven't seen since 1984. And it could even be higher than that. And we haven't seen higher numbers than that. We reached 9 to 10% of GDP growth back in 1959. So... It will be rare air up here when uh, when this economy does recover um, and how quickly it recovers. So that's good news. Um, page four is now, what does that mean? With the economic recovery, we, we do expect inflation rates uh, to move up. Um, and if you, this is, happens to be Morgan Stanley's estimate. If you look in the far right-hand side, those dots moving up to the right, um, they're looking for inflation to move above the Fed target of 2%. Now, the question that economists are going to be debating as we move through that <clears throat> is how much above 2% and how sustainable is that? And that's really going to be a debate, I think, that will be going on for the next year, year and a half at least. Um, our expectation is it'll probably just move slightly above 2% and hold in there. The next page, if you look at page five, and this is looking at bond yield um, since really sort of um, 2001. Uh, if you go back, and this is pre-great financial crisis of 2008, we had the 10-year trading at roughly 4.5%. That is the blue line you see in that chart on the bottom of page five. The red line below it is the 91-day T-bill, which is where primarily the Fed operates in terms of raising interest rates or lowering interest rates. And they tightened into late 2006 and into 2007. And then we ran into the great financial crisis, uh, uh, residential mortgages sort of um, having the, the issues that they, uh, they had. And the Fed dramatically dropped interest rates, you can see, in late 2008 and into 2009 down to zero and kept them there for really the next five to six years. And then 
you can see the blue line, long-term interest rates, the 10-year treasury continued to drop over that period. That economic recession is, was very different than the one we're looking at right now. That recession, when coming out of it, the consumer had a balance sheet that was in trouble, primarily due to residential uh, real estate and overextending um, mortgages and, and debt that had to be written down. The banks, the financial system, uh, had to build up loan loss reserves and had to build up capital. And that took a long period of time. It took that full sort of four to five years. Roll the clock forward to where we are here and sort of, uh, you know, the, the beginning of 2020, we had the uh, long 10-year bond at roughly 2%. And the Fed had tightened. You can see that red line, um, short-term rates had moved up. Coming into roughly a year ago, the Fed significantly dropped rates back down to just above zero. And the 10-year plummeted down to that half of 1% that we talked about. But this economy is going to look a lot different. Uh, the consumer's balance sheet is in good shape. The banks are in good shape. We have the stimulus that we talked about that's going to be a tailwind uh, for the economy. Uh, and then um, we have the vaccinations that should be really kind of kicking off their benefits um, by, by the end of May. This economy is going to look more like the gates opening up at the Kentucky, Kentucky Derby, <clears throat> and we're just going to take off. Um, so that is good news, um, uh, but it could mean, you know, higher, uh, higher inflation of sorts initially. Page six, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, this is really just that 10 year bond. When we sent this to press, that 10 year bond if it was at 1.15. As you can see, it moved up from kind of gradually from the August lows where it was down at 0.5%. And today we're at 1.6%. So we've seen this kind of increase rapidly here in the last two and a half months. So page seven, if we, the near term rise in inflation, that is likely. Um, the big debate, as we mentioned, um, will likely overshoot the Fed target of 2%. The Fed has said they won't object to that. They also have the goal of getting the unemployment rate down. Will that 2% be temporary, that, that rise in inflation above 2%? And we think it will. Um, we're not 100% there, but, um, but there really are some forces that have been pulling inflation down for the past three decades. And they, they're primarily demographic, um, slower growth, not just for the U.S. Um, China's demographics in the next 10 years are going to be worse than the U.S. And by, by demographics, we mean growth in the labor force. And you can see that in the bottom uh, chart on, on page seven. Um, typically, you know, if you go back to 68, 77, we had 2.2% growth in labor force. Um, now, if you look at 2008 to 2019, it's been 0.7%. That may be even dropping to 0.5%. So the growth won't be there in the labor force, in the labor force. Productivity is that gray bar. That's estimated to be roughly 1%. We may get a pleasant surprise there. Maybe it moves up to 1.5%. That would be great. Um, but that, that does serve to sort of dampen inflation expectations. Uh, technological innovation, um, you, you name it, you know, whether it's Apple computer, um, all of the free stuff that we get certainly just access to on the internet versus maybe what had to be paid for, um, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, and then, you know, look at Apple uh, or look at Amazon um, and, and sort of the deflationary force that technology has played, uh, you know, on the economy. The third one, globalization, that may be less of an impact um, as we move forward. Um, we seem to be moving, not just we, the U.S., but the rest of the world, um, stepping back from this. But that that for the past 20 years has been a source of uh, less expensive labor. Page eight, um, just uh, economic outlook. We have a base case, upside case, and downside case. The base case is kind of goes back to my my days working as a stock analyst. This is what we we would come up with when forecasting the the stock price. 
the base case, I would say, is actually the highest, better than a 50% chance, let's say 60%, that the U.S. economy recovers steadily in 2021 20, uh, through 2022. Hotel and restaurants, travel, all of those areas that have been negatively impacted steadily pick up. And then we should see very sharp U.S. corporate profit growth. It's actually moving, the estimates are moving up to the 25 to 30 percent range in terms of the increase in corporate profits. The upside case would be the second sort of likely outcome, say 30 percent. This would be a rapid drop in the unemployment rate, a sharp V-shaped recovery, sharper V-shaped recovery than what we're expecting. And then inflation could become more of an issue in that situation. The downside case, I, I hate to talk about, but let's say that's a 10 percent outcome. Um, that is, if one of those coronavirus variants um, prove more difficult to control, uh, the unemployment rate could flatten out and possibly rise, and then deflation would actually become a concern. Again, we view that as being a very low probability event, but but not out of the uh, realm of possibilities. So, so that that's a quick summation. And again, apologies, I couldn't get on Teams for this presentation, but happy to answer any questions. Do any of the members of the committee have any questions? Uh, I guess hearing none. Bill, did you have something? No, I was saying that uh, I did not have any questions. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. I, I really appreciate the report. You know, I'm going to take away from this uh, your statement about the economy uh, being similar to the being at the gates of the Kentucky Derby ready to take off. So I think that that just shows the optimism and where we're headed. Um, and I, we, we all truly appreciate the Bureau of Investments for, um, you know, kind of always looking ahead and making sure that um, our asset allocation, the way you moved a majority or a big chunk into the cash um, piece of the pie to just maintain our, our, <clears throat> piggy bank because we do have a lot of capital expenditures um, to program. So thank you for your diligence. Well, thank you all for your service. I appreciate it. And, and it's a pleasure working with the board. So thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the audit report, which is going to be informational. I believe we have Nathan Klein from the Office of Auditor General who uh, will just give an overview of the recent audit, which my understanding is it has not been finalized uh, because it's just at the ending stage of quality assurance and quality control reviews internally. So um, Nathan, are you able yep. to? Okay, great. Yep. Do you yep, have here. any slides that you need assistance with or um, is it just a verbal? I, um, I do have slides. I don't know if, if it's best if I share my screen then and I can um, get those available for everybody. Sounds good. Let's see here. Have they come up for everybody? Yes, I see them. All right, awesome. All right, um, thank you, Amy. Um, like she said, my name is Nathan Klein. I am the audit supervisor for the Michigan of the Office Auditor General. Um, who we were, um, we took over this audit from Plant Moran, basically just due to um, budgetary restrictions because of COVID. We weren't sure what our budget was going to look like. So some of these contracted audits that we had CPA firms do, we decided to bring them back. So I think the last time that our office had done the Mackinac Bridge Authority was in 2010. Oh, excuse me, in 2010. So, um, I, I kind of just wanted to start off saying um, what a pleasure it was to work with Cami. She was our Cami Hansen, the CFO, was our lead contact, and I know um, we threw a lot of stuff at her this year for this being her first first year doing this job, and she was extremely helpful, very responsive with everything. So I just we just really appreciated the the working relationship that we had with her. So. Um, I also know that because of the delay in issuing this report, that it is a little different in providing you just this overview, since you guys have not had a chance to look at the released report. Um, that is something that we are hoping to have issued within the next two to three weeks. It's working through our um, quality assurance and our report processing team right now. So 
Um, with that being said, I'm just going to give a little quick overview of the highlights of the report. Um, total assets increased in 2020 by almost $16 million and liabilities increased by a little over $500,000. Um, the third bullet there about third and fourth bullet traffic and gross total revenue that had a direct impact from COVID with um, travel restrictions and people working from home, not going back and forth to work. So um, the total vehicles over the bridge this year was about $3.8 million or a million vehicles, which was down about 10% compared to 2019. And then in relation with that, the uh, total revenue de decreased by about 1.9 million because of the less traffic. So um, with all that being said, the total net position increased by $15.4 million, which um, factors in operating and non-operating revenue and then um, backs out the operating expenses. So the next slide, um, investments did increase by $7 million and operating, operating expenses and bridge man management and um, preservation costs of the bridge, they all decreased throughout the year. Um, looking back at some of the the board notes from last time, I know it was a it was, they made an effort to kind of put a pause on different um, preservation um, projects to to help reduce expenses and that kind of stuff. And there were um, some some toll collection and labor costs that were also reduced because of that. So the next two slides that I have are um, comparisons for the net position in comparison over the last three years. So kind of what, what Woody was just saying in regards to holding on to a lot of that cash, you can see that current investment or current assets and long-term investments decreased. A lot of that was that shift between the, the investments that they kept in the cash because of the, the interest rates. So overall, the board's net position uh, increased to 212, almost $213 million. And you can see here kind of how that was laid out with the operating revenue minus out the operating expenses and then in including some invest $7 million of investment income. So overall, there's about a $15.5 million increase in that position. On to the four slide um let's see here um our report will contain two separate letters uh the first letter is our independent auditor's report on the financial statements and this this letter says that we have audited the authority's financial statements um for year end fiscal year 2020 at this time, we do plan on issuing an unmodified opinion for the financial statements, which means that the statements were fairly presented in all material respects in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States of America. The second letter is a report on internal control and compliance on other matters. Uh, we did not identify any deficiencies that we would consider material weaknesses, which are um, the most serious kind. However, in regards to the year-end closing procedures, um, we, we felt that uh, adding some procedures for MBA to process their year-end closing would be would help the efficiency and accuracy of the preparation of those financial statements. So we tested for compliance with laws, regulations, and contracts. Our test disclosed that no instances of non-compliance or other matters were required to be reported. My last slide here, or just I wanted to touch on a couple of challenges that we we had for the audit, which kind of resulted in the delay of the report. Um, just like every business and everything, we've had we've had a lot of COVID challenges. Um, auditing from 
from afar is a lot different. And normally we would be going to the bridge for about a week and looking at certain capital assets and inventories and reviewing procedures and processes and talking with Cami and her staff, which, um, you know, we were able to do a lot of it through these, these team meetings. Uh, luck and luckily for us, some of the, so normally we would, we would do a risk assessment where we would review certain processes that MBA has, such as like the toll collectors collecting the money at the toll booths and cash counting and, and how the vault process works. We weren't able to do that in person. However, with like the cameras and the new toll system, we were able to view a lot of video and compare those to different IBI reports and stuff. So that, that was very helpful for us uh, to, to review those in, in our risk assessment. Um, we did have a delay in the accounting system for our data. There was there was an issue within this within uh, Sage 50 of of getting us the we call it a data dump, just the mass data of transactions that was done for fiscal year 20. The the solution to that ended up being Cami just giving us. Uh, I think it ended up being a thousand page PDF that our IT team had to convert into Excel. Um, Cami had some delays with other agencies, um, OFM getting her some different amounts, and then those amounts were changing throughout throughout the course of the of the audit. Um, so th that that factored into a little bit of of uh, the delay. And then and the last thing, uh, the capital assets adjustment. So we we did a review of the yearly uh, inventory of capital assets, and it didn't quite match up with what the general ledger was stating. So. We worked with with Cami and with OFM, and were able to get some adjusting entries put into the general ledger, so that now the beginning balances for all the capital assets matches the the inventory list. So um, that's all I have. Again, I want to I want to thank Cami for all of her assistance throughout the audit, and I don't know if anyone has any questions for me. Nathan, were those adjustments that you needed to make one-time adjustments, or will they be recurring in future years? Nope, they were one-time adjustments. We were basically it was just trying to get the the beginning balance of the capital assets for fiscal year 20 was not matching what the general ledger was showing, and so the adjustments that we made were to get that get that beginning balance to to match, and then they should match for for the future going forward. Good, thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Um, does member Seidel have any questions? I do not. Thank you, Nathan. Okay. Yes. You're very yes, welcome. and thank you for putting these slides together too. I know that there was a little yes. bit of uh, baton turn off, and it was a little last minute. So uh, I guess my only ask would be that we do not have the slides in our board packets. So. If we can just facilitate getting those that information, so we can um, have that, and then you know, overall, when I hear an audit says no material weaknesses or no non-compliance, that's a really great thing, and, yes. and <laughs> so we can take a moment and celebrate. You know, also audits are an opportunity to always continue to improve. So, um, you know, we we hear you about some of those um, year-end closeouts and and you know, definitely work to refine those to make it um, a little bit more seamless next time. But yeah, Cami Hansen, she is a rock star. She has really, um, you know, stepped into a very big, big position and, you know, to be able to, to, to glean the information that you needed, I'm sure was no small task. So thanks to both of you for that uh, report. Um, hopefully yep. we'll be able to finalize this at our July um, meeting. Yep, and I did I did provide the reports yesterday afternoon to Cami and Monica. Um, okay. If, if you need a separate copy or um, just nope, just if they have, have them, them, we're fine. We're Perfect. fine. If they have them, then we are fine. So thank you so much, Nathan. You're Appreciate very welcome. It. Thank you. The only ask, could you unshare your screen, maybe? Oh yes. 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 Thank you. All right. Great. All right, the next agenda item is the pandemic traffic and revenue trends, which will be presented by Kim Nowak. Okay, thank you. Um, Melissa, if you'll get the slide deck going again, please. You'll see in tab five of your packet, 
some of the things we're going to share on the slideshow also the traffic trends um, since the beginning of the fiscal year. I didn't realize it wasn't showing up. Hang on one second here. Um, well. No, still not working. can hear her tapping away. Oh, it looks like something's coming up there, Melissa. OK, so um, okay. as I said, these are also in your packet, but. Um, there should be a couple slides back, I think. Oh, OK, from, sorry about that. Yep. There, OK, so this starting in the fiscal year. Oops of October. Okay. You can see October, if you remember at the end of last fiscal year, we were looking good really in the fall because we had a lot of fall traffic um, coming. Some good traffic at the end of the last fiscal year and it was tapering off there in October. You can see we started out ahead and then we fell behind at the end of the month. Um, and then November, we started to get instructions to stay home and not uh, go traveling for holidays and um, keep ourselves safe. So you see our traffic goes down again in November. And Melissa changed the side. We will see um, December, same thing. Uh, we're all staying home and staying safe. So our traffic was uh, down again in December. January, we're coming up a little bit. Um, uh, not a whole lot, but we're still in the negative category. Uh, one more slide, Melissa. February, this is an estimate, although I think Cami probably has the um, good, the audited numbers now, but uh, last February had an extra day in it for the leap year. So when you take out that extra day, I estimated that it would be. Um, uh, just under 5% lower than budgeted. So um, another slide, please, Cami or uh, Melissa. So this shows, uh, and this is also in your binder, the um, fiscal year so far from October 1st to January 31st shows us, oh, and you can't see my cursor, but it uh, shows us down 355 thousand compared to where we would like to be and i just have some comments about that yes it's uh, below budget but when we're coming up on july and august those monthly traffic counts are two and a quarter times more than what we see in january and february so we have a lot of time to make up some difference here and with the good news that woody shared with us with the pandemic and with herd immunity and all that uh, we're hoping for a big uh, summer season. And then also in your binder, I made a comment that uh, we could always do a budget amendment in July and and one big ticket item that we think we may not use in this fiscal year is that um, custom designed and built snooper vehicle that's um, 900 some thousand dollars. So we don't think that will probably stay in this fiscal year anyway, so it's another place for for a budget amendment to help offset some of this money. So fingers crossed for our future traffic this summer. Any questions about that? And uh, I'll just say too that Dean Steiner also helped uh, with the traffic counts. He's always feeding me the good news about uh, where our traffic is, and I say that facetiously because it hasn't been good news this winter. Thank you, Kim. Any questions? No, thanks, Kim. All right, on to uh, agenda item number six, which is the fiscal year 2020 business plan. We have uh, Cami Hansen reporting on this. Cami, if you want to take it away, I believe your slides are up. Uh, 
Hello, how is everybody today? I will be presenting um, the 2022 business plan for you today. Next slide. I added this slide so everybody can see and we actually have it documented that um, the 2020 business plan was actually um, approved by the board on March 4th, 2019. And on March 11th of 2020, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic related to the outbreak of the respiratory disease caused by the new coronavirus. I put this in so we actually have history in our, our PowerPoint, in our board meeting, and um, it explains maybe some of the reasons why we didn't hit our mark on traffic and so on and so forth. Next slide. Our actual calendar year traffic came in at 3,753,392, which was 463,787 less than our business plan estimate of 4,217,179. That being said, I would like to propose a, a change in the estimate for traffic to a fiscal year, which will match the estimates as such as revenues, expenditures, and investments. Next slide. Fiscal year toll revenue came in at 21,296,303, which is a difference of 2,222,639 or 9.5% from the business plan of 23,518,942. And then actual other revenue came in at 467,000, 827, which was 134,970 less than the actual 2020 business plan of 602,797. Next slide. <clears throat> Operating expenses were under by 7,103,471 or 34.9%. Actual expenses were 13,266,937, and our projected business plan, 2020 business plan was 20,370,408. 20, this is mainly due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the restrictions on our labor, and we also postponed a couple um, of our project completions. Next slide. So our overall result minus our investments was a surplus of 4,745,862. Next slide. Our investment outcome was 119,471,744. Which is a difference of $12,668,794 or 11.9 business plan of 106,802,950. The increased ending result will continue to support the cash flow needed for MBA to continue on target for the next 20 years of our planned projects. Next slide. So our projected um, fiscal year estimate 2022 for traffic is 4,329,602. Our projected revenue is 26,334,640. Our projected operating expenses and capital outlay is 18,992,879. And our projected ending investments is 132,612,254. That we keep um, reviewing and, and looking at over the 
20 year um, projected projects. Um, you can see that our lowest year is our 2036 um, year of 2.5 million. Um, and that I believe is when we have a large $72 million project planned in the 2036 year. Next slide. And this is our equipment purchasing timeline that I have added um, just as an informational. Um, it was requested that we give purchasing timeline um, estimates. And as you can see, we um, do have the extend all um, in there, but it's for September 20 of 21. And um, if need be, um, we can remove that. We have also, because of um, the pandemic, removed equipment purchases of the snowmobile, low boy trailers, and the spiders. And that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions? So, Amy, I have a, I have a, a question. Uh, Amy, first of all, thanks um, for the great report. Uh, as I was watching, particularly that last cash flow. Uh, chart that you had up there uh, and, and I know some of you heard me say this before but um, the the, uh, the, the um, advantage of being around for a long time is uh, I remember when that chart was dropping below zero quickly uh, and and we didn't have the fund balance we had no idea how we were going to pay for these uh, repairs that were coming and, and frankly I think two things have happened um, one, some really good engineering to uh, um, really look at what's what's going forward uh, and what's needed. Uh, I guess actually three. The second one is the preventative maintenance by the, the maintenance crews to extend that life because I remember when the projection was the deck needed to be replaced in 2018. Um, and then third, the good financial uh, management by uh, the MBA staff uh, to, to just keep costs down, keep them in control, uh, you know, push off those um, those expenditures that aren't really uh, absolutely necessary and and uh, just the great work that you all do. So um, this is it was a, a great pleasure to, to read this business plan uh, and to see where we are just from a historic perspective of where we've been. So my hats off to all of you. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, if there's no other uh, questions regarding the business plan, I would like to uh, entertain somebody, entertain a motion and, and a support for the fiscal year business plan as presented for 2022. I'll support the business plan. Do um, I have a second? Yep, I second that. Thank you. <laughs> it's got to be one of you, right? <laughs> <laughs> We're both proud to do so. All right, so moved. <laughs> uh, agenda item number seven is next, and that is budget budget amendments. And I believe Kim Nowak is going to be presenting this portion, which is also an action item. Yes, um, I'm just wondering, did we need to vote on the previous uh, action item? Probably. Okay. Do you need to do a roll call vote for this, Kim? Yeah, I'll do that. Chair Trahey? Okay. Yes. Approve. Member Steidel? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. This this next one will be nice and uh, easy and good news for us all. Um, if you remember, we talked a lot about our deficit and um, traffic revenue because of COVID last year, and it amounted to the 1.9 million, which we saw a couple times uh, shown here today. Um, and good news is that part of the uh, COVID relief funds that uh, have been given to the state and to MDOT are going to be able to be used um, to offset that. So uh, we're asking for a budget amendment for the positive 1.9 million coming in from the COVID relief funds that MDOT is uh, managing. I'll make the uh, motion to uh, amend the budget uh, as um, Kim just 
uh, described, including the 1.9 million of COVID relief funds from MDOT. And I'll support that. Did we get a roll call for a vote? Chair Trahey? Yes. Member Steidel? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. All right, it passes. Uh, this is great, Cam. It was the shortest time I've, <laughs> it's the shortest little. It's just nice to know that we can uh, realize some of these relief funds. So uh, thank you for MDAT for um, implementing this with us. Uh, the next agenda item is an other. So if there's any other items that anyone would like to bring up or discuss. Don't we have insurance? Um, thank you. Oh my gosh. I'm looking at my computer, which because it's bigger font than a printout. So thank you, Kurt. It takes the team. Agenda item eight is insurance renewal update, which is informational. And that's with Cami Hansen. So this RFQ presented to you would take effect on 10 1 of 2021 over the past five years. Our insurance costs have increased by 59.2% to ensure we are paying competitive rates. We, we should um, actually do these um, requests for quotes once once every two or three years. So this is just an informational that we're going out for an insurance renewal request. Any questions? How many parties do we think will respond to this request, Cami? When I looked back uh, in the previous um, RFQ, we had seven seven um, vendors that actually put in a RFQ. Sounds good and competitive. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's always been always been a, a competitive um, renewal process. There's always been multiple people, so it's I, I I agree with you. It's it's you know great to get new quotes every two to three years completely support that. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Cami. There's no other discussion. We'll move on to that other item that I was so excited to get to. <laughs> Anything else? No. Um, Member Milliken, are you good? I'm good, yes. Okay, all right, I see him shaking. Um, there is, I believe, uh, item number 10, there's some public comment out there, and I, I did review it, and it looks like those are more related to the general committee, um, not relative to the finance committee, so I recommend that we move those forward to the 1030 regular uh, Mackinac Bridge Authority meeting. That sounds appropriate. Okay. I, yep. Great. Well, thank you everybody for your time. Um, Kim, I'm not sure if there's anything official we need to close this out, except for I'm making a motion. motion. To adjourn. Great. Bill. Yes. yes. Roll call. <laughs> Chair Trahey. Yes. Member Steidel. Yes. Member Milliken. And yes. Okay. Motion yes. to adjourn approved. Great. So yes. we'll see you guys in a half an hour. Um, and we could probably end the recording now. Thank you so much for your time and for everybody else who um, virtually Zoomed in or teamed in. Thank you, Madam Chair.
If you would, when you answer the roll call, please state your location because we are meeting by Zoom. Okay. Um, Chairman Gleason? Here. Davis in Michigan? Vice Chair Trahey? Present. Lansing, Michigan? MDOT Director Ajaba? Director Ajaba, are you on? He had to meet with the Lieutenant Governor today, Kim. I thought that was canceled, so uh, I'll call him again at the end. Uh, we'll go on to Member Steidel. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm present and I'm in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Member Kinley. Present uh, from Lansing, Michigan. Member Milliken. Uh, Member Milliken, present in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Member Cheeseman. Present in St. Ignace, Michigan. Treasurer Eubanks. Treasurer Eubanks, I thought I saw her on earlier. Okay, no response. Um, Council Gleason. Present. And I'll call Director Ajiba one more time to see if he joined us. Present. And Director, where are you joining us from? Ann Arbor. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, the next action item will be the approval of the agenda. And I, I do have one uh, procedural. Uh, I want to have the approval of all the minutes prior to the committee reports. So if there's no other corrections or deletions to the agenda, a motion would be in order to accept as presented. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to. Noted. Is there support to the motion? Billiken supports. It's been moved and duly supported that the agenda be approved as present or as the correction was noted. If there's no discussion on or Kim, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Chairman Gleason. Yes. Vice Chair Trahey. Yes. Director Ajaba. Yes. Member Steidel. Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. Member Cheeseman? Yes. Member Cheeseman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, public comment from the about agenda items only is there any public comment from uh, the public on the agenda items mr chair it appears that we've received two comments submitted electronically but neither one of them apply to agenda items we will read those uh, at the end of the meeting thank you james we'll move right along to uh, committee reports or excuse me, uh, with the correction of the agenda, uh, we'll have the approval of the minutes of all the committee meetings. And you can clearly see there is uh, 11 subcommittee meetings since our last meeting. Uh, I think it's very appropriate that one motion would cover all 11 mit or, uh, meeting minutes of the subcommittee meetings. If there's no objection, one motion would be in order to include all 11 of them. So, Mr. Moved. Chairman, this is Kirk Steidel. I would move that we approve all of the sub or all of the committee meeting minutes, <clears throat> including the official meeting. Yes. <laughs> is there any? Uh, is there support to the motion? I support. It's been moved and supported that the 
minutes of the official Mackinac uh, Bridge meeting, as well as the subcommittee meetings be approved as presented. Mr. Chair, I have a comment. Yes, sir. On page three in the bylaw review and revisions, line two, and with all due respect to the chair, I believe Ms. Gleason's name has been misspelled. Uh, is it EA? <laughs> e -E. <laughs> I'm, trying to find it. I'm trying to find it in here too. I'm used to it being so misspelled so often, but I appreciate you noticing. <laughs> Well, Bill, if it's E-E, -E, it is correct. But no, it, it's G-L-E-A-S-O-N, just like yours. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I hadn't uh, found them yet. But, but it's not the way it reads on her driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> it's duly noted, and thanks for the uh, good ego eye there, Bill. <laughs> is there any other corrections or comments? for the previous minutes. Hearing none, uh, Kim, would you call the roll, please? Chairman Gleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahey? Yes. Director Ajaba? Yes. Member Steidel? Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. Member Cheeseman? Thank you, Kim. We'll move now into committee reports. I would like to ask the chair of the finance committee, Amy, if you would give your report, please. Sure, thank you. Uh, we, we met just prior to this meeting this morning at 9 a.m. Um, the entire committee was present, which is great since there's three of us. <laughs> um, there, were, there were several informational updates and, and two action items, but I do think it's worth reviewing some of the informational um, items that were presented. Woody T uh, Tyler from the Bureau of Investments of the Michigan Department of Transportation spent some time giving us kind of an economic outlook report as well as an investment update of our portfolio. And you know what I really love is it, Woody's analogies, they're great. His, uh, his one today regarding the economic outlook was the economy is taking off like a horse at the gates of the Kentucky Derby. So to me, that just screams positivity. Um, and while, of course, the economic outlook is still dependent very much so on the virus, the vaccines, along with, uh, you know, massive stimulus will lead to a rapid economic recovery, in their opinion. And then regarding our investment update for the Mackinac Bridge uh, Authority portfolio, you know, our performance is highly dependent on interest rates and the portfolio allocations took that into account. They did an excellent job which yielded very good performance for the portfolio despite the pandemic. So um, that's all great news. Uh, additionally, there was an audit report, just an informational with an ongoing audit that's actually complete from uh, Nathan Klein from the Office of Auditor General gave an overview of the recent audit. It has not been finalized because it is uh, undergoing their internal quality assurance review. Um, however, um, his report indicated there were no material weaknesses or non-compliance findings, which is great. Um, in addition, they really uh, wanted to thank and show gratitude for our new CFO, Cami Hansen, for her uh, responsiveness and cooperation during the entire audit process. So um, thanks to our CFO for that. Um, we're hoping that final audit report will be deferred to our July uh, meeting for review and approval at that time. Um, Kim, of course, Kim Nowak gave a little bit of an update regarding the information for the revenue trends, uh, pandemic traffic volumes and that impact. So um, as expected, uh, the, the decrease in revenue was seen to be between 8 and 11 percent for the fiscal for this fiscal year, which uh, started October 1 of 2020. And that's directly uh, tied to um, state orders to stay home and, and, and be safe. So. The outlook for summer, however, is really good. Again, going back to the, the horses at the Derby, we're, we're gonna take off and see so many vehicles going through um, the tolls that it'll be great. 
an action item that I guess the two action items were um, the fiscal year 2020 business plan was presented uh, in detail uh, with an individual plan that was supplied to all the committee members and reviewed. And um, we made uh, a motion and it was approved by all to accept that business plan for 2020. In addition, uh, there was a budget amendment, just one that was presented uh, by Kim Nowak and the essence of that uh, budget, budget amendment was to acknowledge some COVID relief funding that the Mackinac Bridge Authority will soon be receiving in the amount of 1.9 million. So um, that, that was again approved by the committee as a whole and is brought forward to uh, the member at large, the membership at large here. So with that, those two action items, I guess I'd like to make a motion to approve the finance committee approved action item. <laughs> Is that how we do it? Perfect. <laughs> if someone wants to do a second for that. Amy, I will support your motion, but I think with the correction that the business plan is 2022. Thank you very much. It is 2022. And that's, um, that's just good information to know too, that the fiscal year uh, is a little bit different uh, in the, in the aspect that it's 10, one of 2021 to 930 of 2022. Thank you so much for that, Bill. Is there support to Amy's motion? I support the motion, yes. Okay, the motion's been made to accept the uh, financial report uh, and it's been duly second. I do have a couple comments I'd like to make. Uh, number one is, uh, uh, before we get into to discussion here, uh, I'd like to give uh, Director Ajaba a shout out here about doing his due diligence in following through with the amendment that Amy just presented on the $1.9 million to help us offset the toll uh, revenue loss over the past year. Thank you very much, Director. Uh, Thank and, you, Mr. Chair. I give the credit to the entire team. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and well, thank the entire team. And and speaking of, of teams, I want to piggyback on what Kirk Stido had talked about during the finance uh, meeting on uh, the balance sheet. Kirk, I certainly remember those years. In fact, I remember those years at best, they were very low single digits. And when I look at today's report of being one or excuse me, $128 million. It's quite a turnaround. And this year's loss uh, would have been a lot more if it hadn't been for Kim and the entire staff at the MBA and the revisions and the, the severe cuts that they made up there, but yet still uh, preserving the structural integrity of the bridge uh, shouldn't go unnoticed. And uh, Kim, if you would, on behalf of the Mackinac Bridge Authority, uh, thank the entire staff for all the due diligence and all the uh, savings that they actually come up with this year to help us out in our budget. So thank you very much. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would add one other historic um, fact that some of our members don't know, but you, you and I both know that at one point we were looking at significant bonding to, oh. to take care of these projects. Uh, and you, you will both remember those discussions about how are we going to pay for this thing and uh, and to see that last um, cash flow diagram is just so so heartwarming. It's great. I, again, I agree completely with you. It's fabulous work by everybody involved. Totally agree. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Well, thank you, Amy, Bill and Kirk for the uh, Excellent re financial report. If there's no further discussion, the motion would be in order to accept the, or excuse me, the motion's been made. Uh, Kim, if you would call the roll, please. All right, Chairman Gleason. Yes. Vice Chair Trahey. Yes. Director Ajaba. Yes. Member Steidel. Yes. Member Kinley. Yes. Member Milliken. Yes. And Member Cheeseman. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. We'll now move on to 3B, the Infrastructure and Deck Replacement Committee. Kirk. 
Great, thanks, Mr. Chairman. So while we've had this committee for a while, uh, it's been kind of dormant as uh, you know we were working on on other issues. Uh, but after our um, summer meeting last year, when we kicked off the uh, the deck study, uh, the um, the the bridge team uh, led by Julie uh, met with the infrastructure committee. In fact, starting in the fall, we started meeting monthly, and and she's been leading the effort. Uh, and I can tell all the other board members she has a very very good grasp of what's going on, very solid handle on the study, and and uh, is is providing us um, great updates on a monthly basis. But just let me give you a, a, a kind of a quick rundown of what's happened since since uh, our meeting uh, last summer. So they started, I uh, initiated the, the uh, plan in July, pulled together all background information, you know, past reports, traffic, wind, accident data, all of that information. Uh, they they uh, performing the load rating um, review in conjunction with the old deck study. All that stuff is being verified. And then they did field inspections uh, in July. They did coring in October. Uh, they're evaluating the concrete and the steel deterioration, the fatigue, corrosion, uh, and then the capacity uh, is being evaluated as well. Uh, they're, they're doing all of that to determine the remaining service life of the existing bridge for all, all three deck types. So the suspended span, the truss approach spans, and the viaduct span. So, so looking at it from end to end. They've... Um, they're coming up with some rehab projects that are designed to prolong the life of the existing bridge. So examples are the asphalt overlays or the joint replacements and continuing to do the things that frankly have extended that time frame uh, of when major work was gonna need to be done. Uh, much like Mr. Chairman that you and I were, were talking about in the early 2000s that was gonna approach much, much faster. Uh, they're also looking at uh, deck replacements. So they're looking at two to three different alternatives based on the three different uh, deck types. So there's, there's a lot of analysis going on right now and, and they've developed some criteria that's gonna be used to evaluate them. So first and foremost is safety. You know, how safe is it? Second, cost. Third, public perception. And then the fourth one, constructability. And constructability means the, the means and the method, the construction staging, the cost estimating, you know, how all of this, how, how all of it would come together, what would be the impacts to to traffic, and they pull all of those together. <clears throat> and then the other piece they're considering in this is what's the anticipated lifespan of these different replacement alternatives for, for each of the decks? And, and the target is to get to a 75 year service life for, for the new deck. So while, while they're looking at that, they're also benchmarking what's happening with similar bridges around the world uh, to, to make sure that we're learning from uh, experience on other similar type bridges, similar environments, uh, and, and really doing a good solid review of, of what's possible and, and, and what's realistic. Now I can tell you that the project's on schedule and there's uh, plans for a full board presentation in July, <clears throat> excuse me, but I just wanted to give you a kind of a highlight because it's going to be a a rather big deal. I'd rather have, have everybody uh, understanding what they're doing along the way. And so all of a sudden they get to a July meeting and said, hey, look what we did. So there's one really fascinating piece. And, and as part of this, uh, they're doing, uh, they did a uh, wind tunnel testing. And I'd actually like Julie to, to show this video uh, and then do a little narration of what's going on. Because when she showed this to the committee, uh, it was really, uh, really powerful and, and uh, really shows uh, the great work that uh, was done 65 some years ago. So Julie, could you uh, show that video and uh, do a little narration as you as it goes through? Yes, I will. Thank you, Kirk. Um, before we get before we start the video, I just wanted to give you a little rundown of what you're looking at. Uh, this is the behind the glass. You'll see the model itself, which we'll eventually be able to see, have a better view of it. But and this is the um, the, the wind tunnel itself, and so. What you'll see is uh, when, when the video starts, you'll see a, a black arm that kind of rises up and it's, what it's going to do is going to put the, the bridge in motion. And the reason why they do that is because that's the way they run these tests. 
I always thought that, you know, the bridge would be sitting there kind of static, motionless, and then we would, the wind would be introduced and you'd see how it responded. But what they do is they actually put the bridge in motion first and then they see how quickly it dampens. So uh, the quicker it dampens, uh, the motion dampens, the better the, better the um, aerodynamic ability of the bridge. So um, go ahead, Melissa, and uh, we'll put the video in motion. All right, so you can see the black arm moving up slowly and soon the arm will drop. Okay, the arm just dropped. Okay, so now the bridge is in motion all on its own and it's in a torsion motion. And so we're just looking to see how quickly it dampens out and, and stops, stops moving. So anyway, you can see that it, it flat, flattened out pretty, pretty quickly, which is really good news. Um, the second video, which Melissa will play, uh, it's going again. So here the arms rising again, and this time it's. Oh, Melissa played the torsion one again. Um, anyway, we'll watch this one again. This is still the torsion uh, movement of the bridge. This one must be the vertical movement. So they do the torsion and they do like a vertical bouncing movement of the bridge um, to get to. Um, the movement that the bridge is expected to make. So here it's it's vertically bouncing and the arm just dropped. So basically they look to see how quickly the the bridge dampens out. And in our case, it dampens out really quickly. The um, people at the facility were um, pretty amazed at how how well the bridge performed. And um, you know, we always knew the Mackinac Bridge was pretty aerodynamic, but uh, this is really telling to all of us to see really how well it performed. It was it was quite it, it just it was spectacular, really. Um, and the winds that were the bridge was subjected to were in the range of about 150 to a little over 200 mile an hour. So it was it was substantial wind. And that's all I had, Kurt. Great, Julie, that was great. So yeah, just another piece uh, for the authority members. So the, the model that's in there was actually constructed a 3D model, but uh, that's the existing bridge right now. So as they go forward, they can modify that with what the new designs look like. So they, you know, change the grading, uh, change the center mall, they change different pieces they attach those uh, to this model and then run the same wind, te wind test to see what are the impacts of that. So that's why this is so, so significant. Uh, first and foremost, the bridge is, uh, is you know, so uh, well designed. Uh, and then you know, the challenge right now for, for all the engineers is to keep it at that same level when we go to modify it. So uh, I thought you'd all uh, enjoy that video. I know that the committee saw it and thought, wow, this is, this is really good. So. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's the end of uh, my report, and we really uh, we have no items for approval. It was just information. Well, thank you, uh, Kurt. Uh, very, very good report, and I certainly want to thank uh, your committee members, Bill and Kim and Amy and and Julie, obviously, and Cole uh, had a lot of input in uh, those committee meetings as well. Is there any further discussion on? Uh, Kirk's report as far as the infrastructure and debt replacement committee. Hearing none, once again, thank you, Kirk. Uh, we'll now go on to the bylaws committee, and I'd like to call on the chair of that committee, Caroline Cheeseman. Good morning, Caroline. Can you hear me, Caroline? It sounds like you're trying to come okay. through. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Good I, to hear. So you can hear me now? Yes, loud and okay. clear. Okay. Um, as you can see from the 
uh, or could from the minutes that we approved. The bylaws committee met several times between October and today's meeting. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background, we worked from the old bylaws and other organization bylaws that operate in the state of Michigan as we could find them, which was difficult, and the statute. Um, the new draft bylaws are presented in your binder as well as the old, and we believe that the draft presented um, represents the current standards and practices of the Mackinac Bridge Authority, and we believe it's consistent with the letter and intent of the MBA statute. Um, that said, I want to thank Shorty for his years of experience and helping along this process with how the authority actually runs, as I'm rather new. Um, and to Kim and Kathleen and Melissa, who, um, well, Kim and Kathleen for their input, and Kathleen, of course, for making this great document and keeping us in line with um, the rules and Melissa for having to listen to everything and Kim for her expertise. Um, that said, um, before looking at the minutes, which I won't go through line by line because you can read them and it's not a big document, but before looking at them, I would just like to say that we ask if you read them and you have any suggestions or comments that you would get them to us by April 19th, um, which is Patriots Day. And we will meet again after that if necessary, and we hope to have a final document for you uh, in July to approve. So if you look at um, the old and new bylaws, I'll just point out um, a few things. I will say that we updated the old bylaws to make them gender neutral and to um, reflect the current practices of the bridge authority. The article one is new and it generally just sets out uh, who we are and what we do. Article two is the old article one. And since the office of the bridge authority has moved to St. Ignace, that's updated from, I believe previously it was listed as Lansing with no particular address. Um, the membership, Article number three is new and just talks about who is on the authority and how they get there. Uh, article four is the officers, um, mainly the chairperson, vice chairperson, and the executive secretary and their duties. And the remainder is new compared to the, I, the old bylaws, but I think they're pretty standard for modern day bylaws. Um, for organizations, uh, talks about the meetings and how the meetings are run, addresses uh, Shorty's question on what to do about public comments. We've included that in there, um, which I believe uh, started this entire discussion and the uh, process of renewing the bylaws. And then uh, six is standing committees, seven is special committees, and general provisions is how we liaise with other organizations and then finally a conflict of interest and um, the official seal and amendments to the bylaws which just um, is similar to what was in the previous bylaws. So um, again, we hope that you will get comments to us if you have any by April 19th, and we hope to have the final uh, bylaws for approval at the July meeting. Thank you, Caroline, for that very thorough and detailed report on your committee of uh, the uh, restructuring of the bylaws. And I also would like to thank Kathleen as well as Melissa and all the time and work and effort uh, they put in to bring this all together too. If uh, there's no, is there any further discussion on the bylaws that Caroline had just presented to be adopted at our, at our July meeting? Would be nice to give us time to go through. Is there any further discussion? 
Once again, thank you, Caroline. Very good report. Thank you very much. Okay, under old business, uh, tower painting project, uh, Kim. <clears throat> Our tower painting project describing the fourth Mind you that if you remember, we extended the contract last um, fall, and so they have um, the lower section of one tower leg to finish this spring. So hopefully by the July meeting, we'll be able to celebrate the end of our um, 25 some year painting initiative. So council won the outstanding project winner and other five mile long suspension bridges first stripping and repainting in its 60 plus year history engineers designed platforms that allowed for the bridges 552 foot designed as an enclosed lightweight modular space frame capable Winds, a two-story movable steel and aluminum structure that encircled each tower leg. Davit-like outriggers supported the platform, which traveled along cables, to allow painting the tower's upper portion. A second platform, consisting of steel box trusses, was used for the struts connecting the tower legs. And the 2020 Outstanding Project in the Other Structures category goes to... Mackinac Bridge Paint Platforms. The judges were impressed by the solutions provided for the unique challenges on this project. The engineers were tasked with creating a painting platform. This was a two-story movable steel and aluminum structure capable of sustaining 100 mile per hour winds. The solution eliminated the need for almost 400 feet of scaffolding. Ruby and Associates also provided erection engineering, construction engineering, heavy lift engineering and steel and aluminum fabrication detailing services to complete this project. The Mackinac Bridge paint platform project was challenging in many ways. The primary objective was to provide a system that could encapsulate the lead-based paint removed during sandblasting while ensuring worker and public safety. The platform is essentially a canvas enclosed structure the size of a two-story house light enough to be raised and lowered the 550 foot height of the support towers using a set of hoists, yet strong enough to resist 100 mile per hour plus winds. I'd like to thank Moran Ironworks of Onaway, Michigan, who brought us into the design build team and introduced us to Seaway Painting, the prime contractor for the project. Moran offered many refinements to the design and did an excellent job fabricating the intricate platform and assisting in its installation. I'd like to thank Kim Nowak of the Mackinac Bridge Authority, who is receptive to the innovative approach we offered to the challenge of painting these massive towers. I'd especially like to thank Steve Lahakis of Seaway Painting, who brought to Ruby the concept of a hoist-driven modular paint platform and worked closely with us to develop the final product. On behalf of Ruby and Associates, I'm grateful for the opportunity to work on an iconic structure like the Mackinac Bridge in such a tremendously challenging project. Thank you. In so that video puts it all together nicely. And uh, some of those photos, uh, especially of the uh, the putting the platform onto the tower, were attributed to MDOT's Tim Burke, who came up and took some videos and some nice photos. So it turned out quite nice. And it was really uh, nice to be involved in such a complicated project and have it be so successful. and. In fact, it was got so much notoriety. We had visitors, uh, engineers from Golden Gate Bridge come and look at our platform design to see if they wanted to um, perhaps use something similar. So uh, a very nice project to be involved in. And that completes my report on that. Thank you, Kim. As usual, an excellent report. And uh, is there any further discussion on Kim's 
report on tower painting, uh, the 25 year project on my bed. <laughs> if there's no further discussion, we'll move on to old business number six, full software update, uh, informational. Cami, good morning. Good morning. The new tool software um, system has been stable and overall very reliable. We have encountered no issues to date. Um, we have now entered the maintenance phase with IBM in phase three, which is the technical support with FAG and consulting. On January 1st, um, MBA stopped accepting MacPass cards at the toll booths. All MacPass customers must now have MacPass stickers. The MBA gave um, all customers almost 15 months to switch out their cards for their tags. And that has um, been going pretty smoothly. So most recently, the IBI staff and MBA were able to work together to finally get everything operational for the Apple MacPass app. A press release will go out as soon as um, we know that it is um, reliable and available also will be the Google app. IBI, Fagan, and MBA still meet monthly to discuss maintenance system needs and resolutions to any issues that may have surfaced. Active accounts as of February 28th are 32,209. Business accounts are 1,025 of those. Personal are 31,000. 185 and we have actually distributed 45,395 tags as of February 28th of 2021. The classification of the unaudited information um, for February um, 2021 is we had 200,323 vehicles cross, 90.4% of that being autos. 9.6 being trucks and 0.04% being RVs. Um, and the cash type payment for the month of February was 55.5% being cash, 11% um, being credit, and 33.5% being the MAC pass. Any questions? Any questions of Cami? I, I just. <laughs> Can't say enough of how nice to see a report of this nature, being that uh, we've had so many struggles in the past and how smooth this transition is working. Good work by all. Prior to this, what was the ratio of cash and credit of fares coming across the bridge? Um, I'm not ex I'm not 100% sure on those numbers right now, but I know for. Um, you know, several months we didn't collect cash, so it's kind of a skewed number for this previous um, year, but I can put that together and send it to you so you have a comparison of um, where our MAC pass has grown. Well, it looks like it's a, a great improvement. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions of Cami? Hearing none, uh, Cami, thank you for the excellent report. Good job. Thank you. Under new business, uh, this will be a action item. It's the uh, use for the Bridgeview Park. And Julie, I believe that you're going to uh, present this. I will, thank you for the opportunity. Let me share my screen. I'd like to introduce to you um, Guy Meadows. He is the um, director of the Marine Engineering Laboratory at the Great Lakes Research Center. And he is, um, that, that Great Lakes Research Center is part of Michigan Tech University. So he is here today to talk to you and seek permission to use the Bridgeview Park uh, for the purpose of installing a high frequency radar. And I will give it over to Guy to explain his project. Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you to, to the, the board, to uh, uh, Executive Secretary Nowak, and, and to Chief Engineer Neff. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and hopefully answer all of your questions of, of what we would like to do. I'm Guy Meadows from, from Michigan Tech. Uh, my team is uh, 
composed of Laurel Meadows, who is the real expert in high frequency radar, especially in uh, freshwater situations, and Jason Swain, who has recently retired from the U.S. Coast Guard from Station Portage here in, on the Keweenaw Waterway in Houghton Hancock, um, and under the direction of, of Sector Sioux. Um, we've had a long history uh, in the Straits region, trying to make the region as, as safe as possible. Uh, we launched our first environmental monitoring buoy in 2015. The purpose of that buoy uh, was to measure waves and the underlying currents in the in the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, you, you, I'm sure, are aware that the state of Michigan entered into an agreement with Enbridge that uh, when waves exceed uh, eight feet in height, uh, the oil spill uh, cleanup equipment is is pretty ineffective in terms of cleaning up oil. So Enbridge stops flow in the pipeline as a part of that agreement when waves exceed eight feet. Uh, to better support that decision, uh, we're adding a second buoy, the upper right-hand corner, which is the gold standard of wave measuring buoys uh, across the world, uh, and that will go operational this spring. Uh, beginning in 2012, uh, we developed underwater autonomous technology to measure unsupported span lengths. In the lower left-hand picture is a is a advanced sonar image of the Enbridge pipeline. Uh, the shadow you see where the pipeline emerges from the uh, pile of material um, indicates uh, the length of unsupported length, and we measure that very precisely. We've ch we've transferred that technology. Uh, to commercial firms, and that is now the way that unsupported span lengths of the pipeline are are measured. Uh, prior to that, uh, they were recorded, re, uh, required by federal regulation to measure the span lengths uh, once every four years. We now have that. Uh, we could do uh, each pipeline in a day, so it could be done every other day if if necessary. And finally, in the lower right-hand picture, I assisted the Michigan State Police on both vehicle recoveries off the Mackinac Bridge, the Yugo in the late 1980s, and the, the Bronco we did uh, with our underwater vehicle almost exclusively through two feet of ice uh, in the mid-1980s. Back to the first buoy for, for a moment. The picture on the left needs a little explanation. Uh, across horizontally, that represents a week worth of measurements. Measurements of the, these are measurements of current flow. If the flow is above the line, as my pointer indicates, that's flow from Lake Huron into Lake Michigan, heading to the words the northwest. Uh, over here on the right hand side, you notice the flows have reversed, um, and that is a flow from Lake Michigan into Lake Huron. The brighter the colors, the stronger the flow. So what we see is that the flow reverses every day, day and a half or so. Uh, very complicated, and the buoy measures that vertically as well uh, down to the bottom. And this buoy is in 100 feet of water. This is roughly every one meter it measures that, and every 10 minutes. All of our data in the Straits is instantly available to the general public, uh, to anyone who, who can make use of this data. And finally, in the lower right-hand cor corner, I was appointed by Governor Snyder to hold the seat on the Pipeline Advisory Board representing Michigan's public universities. Uh, when the RFP we released to consulting firms for the independent risk analysis uh, failed with the consulting firm, the board unanimously voted to remove me from the board and ask me to organize Michigan's universities to conduct the independent risk analysis, which resulted in a 600-page report and a tremendous effort with uh, Michigan Tech and uh, our partners at NOAA to develop a new state-of-the-art predictions, numerical hydrodynamic pr prediction scheme for Lake Michigan and Lake Huron to accurately depict the flows through the Straits of Mackinac. So our high frequency radar and how did we get here? I'll, I'll speak in a moment about what high frequency radar really is, but first some alphabet soup from the US government. The IOS Integrated Ocean Observing System uh, is a national 
program run through NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and they operate high frequency radar stations and make other types of environmental observations all across the waters of, of the United States. Uh, the Great Lakes uh, Observing System, GLOS, G-L-O-S, is the regional association for the Great Lakes, eight Great Lakes states uh, that receives funds from IOS to do buoy measurements throughout Great Lakes, forecasts of severe conditions, and now uh, high frequency radar. So through GLOSS from the Integrated Ocean Observing System in 2019, we received $300,000 in federal funds to purchase two uh, independent radar systems from a company called CODAR. Um, we conducted a one-week site uh, investigation uh, with Michigan DNR and uh, their engineer Michelle Crook was assigned to, to assist us with that to look at state-owned property on both sides of the Straits of Mackinac to locate these radars where they would be in an ideal position to to image the currents in the in the Straits of Mackinac. And we did a test deployment in May of 2019 that also lasted about a week. Uh, 2020, we received an additional 150,000 from the Great Lakes Research Center, again, NOAA funds uh, in terms of their the color of their funding um, to, to move towards being the first uh, freshwater operational uh, high frequency radar system. And that will provide 24-7, 365 surface current maps uh, throughout the straits on the west side of the bridge. And I'll discuss that in a moment. So we're working very diligently towards being operational by uh, later this year. Uh, we also see received a commitment of $70,000 per year for operation and maintenance of this system on into the future. And finally, uh, this year, the state of Michigan uh, added 150,000 to to this effort uh, from Eagle, from James Clef, uh, to work with MDOT and DNR to gain access to these sites, uh, to uh, build environmental enclosures for the electronics so that they will operate uh, throughout our entire year. And we are have a very harsh environment for these to operate in um, and to do some additional things. So. So that is a summary of the funding that we've received to, to make this happen. Quickly, what, what is high frequency radar? First of all, it's not radar in the, in the sense that we think of with respect to navigation radar or aircraft radar. It is very low power system uh, and it operates uh, actually below the FM radio band and not in, in the high frequency radar bands that you're used to seeing. So we operate at 41 megahertz, which is uh, below standard FM radio, which is about 90 to 107 megahertz, and we operate at extremely low power. The radar unit transmits less than 40 watts, which is the, the power of a, of, a, of a small household light bulb. They are Doppler radars, so they are analogous to, to what the friendly people on the side of the road use to, to measure vehicle speed. Uh, they transmit a pulse and they look for the change in frequency in the return pulse off the, the target. And if the target is a, a automobile, as in this, this example, if the automobile is approaching the radar, then the return pulse is at a higher frequency and shorter wavelength than the transmitted pulse, and that's called the Doppler shift. If the vehicle is moving away from the radar, same thing happens, but in the in the opposite direction, the, the pulse becomes stretched, longer wavelength and lower frequency. In the case of these radars, our high frequency radars, they're designed to look at moving targets on the water surface, and those targets are wind generated waves. Uh, the wind-generated wave that has a wavelength of half of the transmitted wavelength of the radar will make a very bright return to the radar. Uh, that's called Bragg scattering. So the waves that we are going to be sensitive to are about one second in one and a half seconds in period and about 10 feet or so in wavelength. And those wind-generated waves are present most of the time 
uh, throughout the Straits of Mackinac. So if those waves are moving towards the radar, we know the speed that those waves should be moving very precisely. Uh, and if they're moving faster than that, that is attributed to an underlying current. If those waves are moving slower than they should be, that's attributed to a, a receding current moving the waves away from, from the radar. And if you have two radars set up, separated by a substantial distance, um, you can then resolve the vectors on the surface, and we will know the exact direction and magnitude of, of surface currents. And that's exactly what we are proposing to do. Uh, this data would be available again to everyone uh, on a common website once an hour and not have to be removed in the winter like the buoys do uh, that, that we are presently operating in the Straits. So it is all season and all weather conditions. So summary, it's a very mature technology. It's been in operation on our ocean coast for over 40 years. It's very low energy, less than a household light bulb. It will produce hourly uh, near real time maps of the surface currents, which are critical in terms of, of a number of, of important uh, applications. And according to the, to the uh, manufacturers, relatively low maintenance. So we'll see how that works out in our climate. But there is a number of critical applications. Um, they're used uh, nationwide for search and rescue or anything that you need to know where, where something placed in the water surface uh, will be transported. So, so finding victims of, of, of vessel accidents for water quality monitoring for marine navigation. Uh, again, this will be available to the ships in real time and then they'll know what the current structure, the complex current structure is in the Straits of Mackinac as they're approaching that that confined region. Uh, they're used for rip current measurements, nearshore regions, harmful algal blooms, fisheries and ecosystem management, and most importantly, oil spill response. Uh, they will also be used to increase our programs with NOAA in, in, in improving hydrodynamic modeling throughout the Straits regions. And unique to our application is they all also see ice flows. Uh, anything that is moving relative to the surface of the water, they will predict. Um, we do see a little bit in, in our trial condition of large trucks, like you see in this picture, crossing the Mackinac Bridge. So we see their Doppler shifts as well. And we do our best to mask out the presence of the bridge in our radar platforms. This is a national program. Uh, it's been an operation on the ocean coast for quite some time. Uh, it, as I said earlier, operated by the Integrated Ocean Observing System, which is part of NOAA. Great Lakes Coast, there are 150 operational sta stations on our saltwater coast, um, including Hawaii, Alaska, and Puerto Rico. There are none in freshwater, and there are none anywhere across the eight states of the Great Lakes. So it has been about a 20-year venture to convince the U.S. government that the fact that these radars operate uh, so effectively on the ocean coast where there is a stronger coupling between the transmitted radar waves and the salty water, they work out to 100 to 200 miles off the coastline. In the Great Lakes or in freshwater, they only operate out to about 10 to 20 miles. Uh, the saltwater coast considers that a massive failure. Um, and we consider that as the most important part of our Great Lakes coastlines. It's where our municipal water intakes are located. It's where our congested marine traffic is. It's where our underwater infrastructure is located. So we have finally convinced the U.S. government uh, to, to invest in a, in a fresh water system. For scale, um, the barrel there is 10 kilometers. Uh, the straits are about six and a half kilometers across. And this is what we are proposing. A site number one on the south side, which is located just to the west of the historic park. And we received permission from the historic park commission just last week to, to occupy that site. And a second site uh, at Bridgeview Park, just west of the, of the bridge. 
uh, both of our environmental monitoring buoys will be within the footprints of the radar and where those two radar patterns intersect we will have complete coverage of of surface currents in that area and, and as i said we need to map out we need to mask out your your beautiful large bridge because it is a uh, very large grounding antenna in its uh, in its present form so we try not to uh, to get interference from your bridge this is what we're asking for we're asking to occupy uh, a spot uh, on the uh, outside shed there of, of Bridgeview Park and erect our antenna in the, in the lower right hand corner is a view of what the antenna actually looks like. We are proposing to place the antenna on the west side of Bridgeview Park uh, in the grass area, uh, but yet far enough to the north so that it does not obstruct the view from inside uh, the park, uh, inside the pavilion. We are proposing to hire a commercial company to bury the radar cable uh, underground and under uh, your pavement and under the paver blocks and return the site to the way it looks right now. Uh, we are also proposing to hire a, a local uh, electrical. So people can question what is this and, and have some kind of interaction to understand it in a layman's term. I see, if there are no other comments, I see that we also have the uh, draft of the permit agreement in front of us. And uh, being guilty of, of having written a lot of real estate agreements, uh, there are several paragraphs in here where I thought we might be able to tighten them up a little bit to clear up some ambiguity. And uh, I will, let me just walk through them quickly and I'll be glad to submit them uh, to Julie or somebody in writing if they're deemed useful. And Paragraph seven on the back page of the permit um, concludes with uh, unless approved ahead of time. And I would suggest that uh, uh, a number of days in advance in writing be substituted for that. Paragraph 10, line two, permit he agrees that it will immediately remove all people. And I would suggest within a certain number of days following written notice from the Bridge Authority. In the next paragraph, paragraph 11, uh, the second to last line, <clears throat> $75 per employee hour, and I'd suggest prompt reimbursement shall be the sole responsibility of the permittee. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I believe that there's probably a timing factor here uh, rather than uh, look at the revisions that Bill had put in. I don't see any reason why, if obviously, a uh, guy would have to agree with those changes as well. If we couldn't approve it today, contingent on the recommendations from Member Milliken, uh, I would hate to see this be offset maybe uh, do the timing of it. And it certainly is going to be much easier to uh, work with the ground uh, when the frost is gone, rather than if it's prolonged too long, then we have a problem with the frost. Uh, does guide, are you fairly comfortable with that? Oh, very much so, thank you. Okay. Uh, any Mr. questions, concerns for the members? Yes, Kirk. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, hearing that, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to make a motion that we approve this permit contingent upon the successful uh, revision um, as presented by Member Milliken uh, and as approved by um, the Attorney General Gleason uh, to enter into the contract or in, enter in, to issue the permit. I'm sorry. Is there support to that motion? I'll support that. This is Tricia Kinley. Thank you, Trisha. It's been moved and supported that the uh, permit be granted with the uh, provisions that Member Milliken had provided us with. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Hearing none, Kim, would you call roll, please? Yes, I will. Chairman Gleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahey? Yes. Director Ajaba? Yes. 
Member Steidel? Yes. Member Kinley? Yes. Member Milliken? Yes. And Member Cheeseman? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Guy, once again, uh, thank you for the very thorough and very interesting report. We look forward to uh, seeing this complete operation in place in the Straits of Mackinac. And once again, uh, you, when you stop and think about it, the all the other uh, factors that were mentioned here, but it's the first fresh waters uh, yes. uh, location here in the United States. That itself says a lot. Thank you. Thank you and thank all the board members. I appreciate it sincerely. We'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, and Julie, thank you for uh, the introduction of Guy and your work behind the scenes as well. OK, and, uh, under new business, item eight, uh, it's informational and it's a house bill for into a non-technical presentation. So we're going from radar devices to manure haulers. So quite a variety of topics at our board meeting today. Um, you'll see in uh, tab number eight on your packet that I gave you some background information of where this house bill related were hauling um, equipment that wanted to cross the bridge and uh, back in July and was told no by our bridge personnel who later got the Michigan State Police involved and was told no by the Michigan State Police. And then um, also you'll see in the packet there how the um, MDOT uh, permits agent there was in told this person no they could not cross because uh, uh, I-75 and the bridge are part of the limited access highway and farm tractors are prohibited from operating on the limited access highway and so the only way this farm tractor and manure hauler could come across uh, legally would be on its own it would need a um, permit from MDOT to come across on the trailer. Um, so since that time, um, this bill was proposed that would allow the farm tractor and manure hauler on the bridge. Um, doesn't really address the interstate highway leading to and from the bridge. Um, you can see the status of the bill. I uh, checked it just yesterday to see if there's any more status and I've been tracking that bill and there hasn't been any other um, uh, things happening with the, that bill. So um, also I included uh, some media that was um, done, an article that was from Mears News about the farm tractor and then I also included the actual proposal of House Bill 4165 uh, where it shows what they'd like to add in and cross out of um, of Public Act 214. So I'm I'm working with uh, Troy Hagen from MDOT, who is the liaison to the legislation legislators, and um, following this bill closely. Thank you, Kim. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Uh, so, Kim, as I as I read this this article, particularly the the Mears article, it talks about how he's done this before, uh, and the last time he was stopped. Let's say uh, that that doesn't make sense to me. Let's oh, okay, yes, and so I I researched that a little bit because yes, he did say that, and so um, I asked our overnight supervisors, you know, what do they know about this person, and so. Um, he did come across one uh, night. He, he has he has threatened to come across in the dark of night on his own, but he did come across in the night one time after he was told not to in the past. And then another time he showed up and demanded to come across in the motor carrier. Um, and our previous staff uh, told him he could come across one time 
but the next times he would have to be trucked across on a trailer. So um, our staff did did remember two times that he did come across. Okay. What were those dates, Kim, of his crossing? You know, I don't have that right here. I don't. Uh, I don't really know how far in the past that was. But, like but he has. He has since come year? across on. Excuse me. He's he's come across on a trailer, um, but we don't know <laughs> how many times he's come across because it's just a normal legal trailer load that's coming across, and we, you know, we wouldn't know when he's coming. This is a informational item. Is there any other questions, comments for Kim? I do have one one th one hint here. Um, the one time that he came across after uh, the motor carrier, it was when the previous executive secretary was working. So that would have been prior to um, May of 2019. <laughs> Any other comments? Thank you, Kim. That was uh, informational item. Number nine uh, will be an action item. I'd first like to just mention uh, 9A, the May 2021 special meeting. We're taking a uh, good look at what things may look like for our Labor Day walk in 2021. 2021 Labor Day walk is still scheduled and hopefully we can proceed, but if uh, it looks like larger crowds and things of that nature will not be permitted, we may have to call a special meeting to address that matter. And that's why item A is there. Uh, item B is our summer meeting on Mackinac Island. It will be July 8th and 9th of 2021. And item C, we, we've got it narrowed down to Two different dates there, October 7th and 8th, or the 14th and 15th of October. Uh, as you remember, we had to cancel our event uh, or meeting schedule uh, last October due to COVID situation. And hopefully we can reschedule that in Houghton at the Michigan Tech. So I'm just opening this up for discussion right now, but we we should make a decision about the 7th or 8th or 14th or 15th of October for our next regular meeting, or excuse me, the fall meeting. And do we want to uh, return to our original plan, which was in Houghton Hancock at the Michigan Tech University? With that being said, I'll open it up for discussions. Chairman Gleason, uh, this is Tricia Kinley. I, I would wholeheartedly support uh, going back to that original plan of going to Houghton, reg regardless of the date. I think it, it was a great idea, and we've got three Michigan Tech grads to showcase and take the show on the road, so to speak. Well, thank you, and I would certainly support that as well. It's our obligation to, um, here we meet uh, throughout the state of Michigan, to give the general public uh, everywhere an opportunity to see the operation and function of the Mackinac Bridge Authority meetings. Is there any further comment on that? I guess the, I, I, oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. I just, the only conflict, I do have a conflict on the 7th for October. Um, it's far enough out where I could change it, but if there's no other preferences out there, I would prefer the October 14th and 15th. I knew I shouldn't let you go first. Ah, were you going to say the opposite? <laughs> I was going to say the opposite, but frankly, I'll, I'll, make, a gentleman. I'll, I'll make either of them work. It's all right. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. I don't know, Bill, are you trying to come in? I've seen. I, I, um, 
I've got a conference uh, in Pittsburgh on the 7th and the 8th that's on my calendar, so I'd go to the 14th if it were me. Okay. Well, like any good chairman, uh, he always accepts or she accepts the first motion made. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really that official? <laughs> Please proceed. I, okay, I make a motion for the uh, to accept the uh, 2021 meeting schedule uh, as presented, with the exception, or we're going with October 14th and 15th uh, for the Houghton meeting, striking that, the October 7th and 8th. And we hopefully can. Uh, be part of that motion, Amy, that it would be at the Michigan Tech University. Uh, yes, and Houghton, yes. Houghton Hancock. Yeah. I'll support Amy's motion, please. It's been moved and supported that we accept the meeting schedule for 2021 with the meeting in October to be October 14th and 15th in Houghton Hancock at the Michigan Tech University. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Um, Shorty, I would really love to zero in on one of those May dates for a tentative meeting, if we could also. Okay, yeah, that's, that's fine with me, Kim. That's a very valid point. Uh, Wait, well, we, well, go yeah, ahead, yeah, yeah, no, you, you're, you're going to go to May and then we're going to vote on the whole schedule together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to amend that right to the motion. If, if yep. We, Jim, uh, you want to start out the uh, possible dates with everyone? Yeah, and so these, we were looking at the 13th, 17th, 18th, or 19th of May for a tentative special meeting to talk about the walk if we need to have it. And, and Kim, you're, you're uh, suggesting probably an early meeting, a morning meeting, uh, like typical? Yep, yep, it could be a nine o'clock meeting. Bill's got a conflict on May 19th with all the others work for me. Yep. Me as well. Me as well. And I, I have a conflict on the 13th, but the rest of the dates work for me. <laughs> okay, we narrowed it right down to the 17th or 18th, if need be. Is there any conflicts there of May 2021? Amy, as maker of the motion, would you be agreeable to amend your motion to include one of those dates? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to amend the motion to include the special meeting for May 18th. I'm going for May 18th of 2021. Very good. Uh, I think it's pretty impressive of Dean is that because of those special events, in his organization to make them go like a well-oiled machine, the economic impact for the St. Ignace and Mackinac City equates to about $25 million a year prior to the COVID. So Dean, uh, we're really happy for you and Lori going forward and thank you for your 36 years of service to the Mackinac Bridge, but that doesn't exclude that you still can't give me a fishing report from Lake Brevard occasionally. Uh, you certainly will have time to do so, but uh, we wish you and Laurie the best and uh, thank you for your great service to the Mackinac Bridge. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the kind work. You're welcome, Dean. Thank you. Well. Okay, uh, I guess I would like to conclude the regular part of the meeting. We're going to be going into uh, a closed session, an executive session here shortly to for the purpose of discussing security measures. Uh, at this time, it would be appropriate to have a motion to go into closed section before the motion. Oh, I would like to add that when we come out of closed session, 
the only action of the bridge authority would be uh, to adjourn the meeting. So I would just let our general public know. Uh, so without that, a motion would be in order to uh, proceed to closed session for the purpose of secure, er, discussing security measures. Sir, did, did, you, did you want to do the public comment? Oh, I am so sorry. I apologize for that. Too many notes, I buried it. Uh, James or Monica, uh, do we have any public comments to be read? Yes, Mr. Chair, we, we have the two public comments that uh, came in electronically before the meeting. I'll, I'll read those two now. Uh, the first one is from Glenda Szeski. She writes, when my husband and I cross the bridge, we make the same observation. Semi trucks obeying the bridge speed limits. We are passed by vehicles that have to be going 55 and 60 miles per hour. Our son lives in Indiana on the border of Kentucky with a bridge over the Ohio River. They have the technology to take a picture of your license plate and cross your speed leaving Indianapolis on Highway 65 to send you a speeding ticket for speeding with a picture to prove your speeding violation. This is a lost revenue for the Mackinac Bridge Maintenance Fund. You already have the black ball cameras hooked up. Post an alert warning to drivers that their speed is being tracked. Even if you can't legally send a ticket because of close traffic at times, it would sure make the bridge safer for all drivers by slowing drivers down. Isn't the posted speed limit of 45 what the limit should be on the bridge? It, um, sorry, uh, isn't that the original speed put in place by the original designers signifying the correct speed to safely cross the bridge when they designed it? When people fly by us, we always think of the woman that did go over the edge of the bridge due to her, her speed. The Mackinac Bridge is a beautiful bridge to cross, and we wouldn't want any changes made to it. All that needs to happen is a traffic slowdown. Oh, which brings us to a confusing sign heading north approaching the bridge. If I recall correctly, there was a speed limit sign that says speed limit 60 miles per hour posted within 75 to 100 feet prior to the Mackinac Bridge speed limit sign stating 45 miles per hour. If you haven't noticed, it would be impossible to go 60 and then suddenly step on the brakes to go 45. Maybe the people heading north only see the 60 mile per hour sign. That sign needs to go. It is a very confusing sign in that location. It's worth investing. Thank you for allowing me to share my slash our concerns. Uh, the second comment we received is from Donna Thackray. Does the MBA have an idea or a time frame in mind as to when they are going to reestablish the drive across service for people who are not comfortable driving over the bridge? And Mr. Chair, that concludes the public comments we received. Thank you, James. Uh, Kim, if you would note that, and uh, obviously I, I'm sure the state police would like to hear about the the speeding across the bridge. <laughs> yes, I'll forward that along. Thank you. OK, uh, a motion would be in order to uh, go into executive session. Mr. Chairman, I'll make the motion that uh, the board meet in closed session under Section 8 H of the Open Meetings Act to discuss security material that is exempt from disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act. I'll support that. It's been, moved. Bill. it's been moved and supported that we enter into executive session. And would you call the roll, please? <clears throat> yes, Chairman Gleason. Yes. Vice Chair Trahey. Yes. Director Ajaba. Yes. Member Steidel. Yes. Member Kinley. Yes. Member Milliken. Yes. Member Cheeseman. Yes. Thank you.
back on okay being no further business of the Mackinac Bridge Authority a motion would be in order to adjourn I move adjournment of our meeting is there support to the adjournment motion support and move support it that the Mackinac Bridge Authority uh, be adjourned Kim, would you call roll, please? Yes, Chairman Gleason? Yes. Vice Chair Trahey? Yes. Director Ajiba? 